Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. Those of you who are joining us online, so glad that you're able to invite us into your home and thank you for making your way here this morning. As you were driving in, you saw that there was an accident in front of uh, the church on the road right here at Scotts Hill Loop Road. Just want to let you know that all people involved in that are okay. One of those is a, a young lady from the life of our church who was involved in that accident and the other one was a man in our community. So we're grateful that the Lord protected them. We'll be checking up on on them and continue to pray for them. And we're grateful how the Lord protects us as we make our way just in the regular routines of life. I also want to remind you of something that's coming up in the life of our church. We're calling it Leader Launch. It's a really important time in the life of our church. Leader Launch is all about investing in our leaders and our servants in the life of Scotts Hill. It is a time to unify our, our teams together, to extend our teams, and to equip our teams to be able to do effective ministry in the upcoming year. If you are a leader at Scotts Hill, we want you to be a part of this. It takes place on Saturday, August the 20th from 8.30 in the morning to 12.30. We're going to have a breakfast for you. The doors open at 8 o'clock. We have breakout sessions. We have all kind of exciting times to help and to connect all of our people together. If you're in this church, but you're not serving, but you would like to serve and you want to find a place to serve, we want to invite you to this as well. You can go to scottshill.info and you can get all the information you need to be a part of this exciting time in the service in the life of this church and even outside the walls of this body as we continue to serve the Lord. So there's a piece of information I want to get to you. I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I grew up in a time where we didn't have um, computers. We didn't have um, game uh, playstations. We didn't have video games. Our television sets only had three channels, and so it was quite boring. So growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we did most of our activities outside. And the rule was, mom said, come home when the streetlights come on. And so we were gone all day. We played together. And as we played, we did all kinds of adventures together. We usually operated in packs, you know, a bunch of friends here, a bunch of friends there. And so we did everything together outside. It was an incredible time. It's just no wonder that I'm not dead from those days of the things that we were involved in. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But in every neighborhood, even in the midst of all the packs that kind of go around, there was always one guy that everybody feared. He wasn't necessarily the bully. He was just the toughest guy in the neighborhood. He was the no-nonsense guy. He was the guy that didn't put up with much, and he didn't take much, and he wasn't afraid of anything. In our neighborhood, his name was Alden LeBlanc. And Alden was a tough Cajun kid. He wasn't scared of anything. But everybody respected Alden. Now, he could be your friend, but he can also be your worst nightmare. So he was this kind of guy. I mean, he's the guy that taught me how to first smoke a cigarette. He's the, he's the guy that taught me how to distract the clerk at the 7-Eleven while he was throwing merchandise out the back door. He was the guy, like I said, who could be your friend, but can also be the guy that you are afraid of. One day, my brothers, Dennis and David, and I, along with my two cousins, Scott and Brett, it was a summertime. We were playing in the football field of Glen Oaks High School. All the kids gathered there um, all the time to play ball and to whatever, whatever activities we were doing. And we were making our way there. And as I was going, I was the guy that always found money. I don't know why, but I'm walking along and there's under this bush is a dollar bill. Now you might think a dollar bill is not much. It certainly isn't today. But back then, a dollar bill could buy you a lot of candy at the 7-Eleven. Well, I grabbed this dollar bill, scooped it up, and everybody's around me, and I start declaring my independence and my wealth uh, among everybody. I found a dollar. I found a dollar. Everybody starts kind of gathering around you, and here comes Alden. And Alden looks at me, and he says, I'll take that dollar, Phil. And I said, no, Alden, I found it. He said, you don't understand. I know where the principal lives, and I'm going to bring it to his house. Like anybody believed that. And I said, no, I think I'm going to hang on to the dollar myself. He said, you don't understand. I want that dollar. And my two brothers and my two cousins are standing behind me. And they're whispering in my ear. They're saying, don't you give that to him. We got your back. If he comes over here, we're going to gang up on him. You stand up to Alden. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I look at Alden and I take that dollar bill and I said, this is my dollar bill. If you want it, you got to come through me to get it. And when I turned my back like to give a nod to my posse, 
They were running away. They, all four of them ran home. All I could see were their elbows doing this. And I'm standing there by myself and I just threw the ultimate challenge to the toughest kid in the neighborhood. If you want this, you come get it. And as I'm standing there, I know I'm gonna pay the price. Alden's gonna teach me a lesson in front of everybody. I might as well go down swinging. And when he stepped up to me, I said, you want this? Here it is. And when he turned his attention to it without looking, man, I sucker punched him with a right, right to the jaw. Man, it was on, buddy. After that sucker punch, I hit him in his fist with my nose. And then I hit him in the other fist with my eye. And then I hit him in the stomach with his right fist. I hit me, yeah. And so I'm on the ground, he's worn out, takes my dollar, and I'm left alone. And, and, and the worst thing about the whole thing wasn't the fact that Alden beat me up. He had done it before and he was gonna do it again. The worst thing is that the guys who had my back turned their back and ran away. That was the worst thing. The next week, Alden and I were friends again. He was actually surprised and impressed that I got that sucker punch in on him. But my brothers and my cousins ran away. Now, you may have never faced an Alden LeBlanc in your life, but I can guarantee you people in this room have had times where people you've counted on turned their backs on you. The people that you thought were gonna be there, the people who made the promises after your spouse died that we're gonna remember you, and yet they've gone dark. The people who said, yeah, we're gonna pray for you in your family crisis, but every time they see you coming, they wanna avoid you. The people who you know, the promises that have been made to you in the past have been broken and covenant relationships have ended. You're in good company because the Lord Jesus, he knew what it was like for people to turn their back on him. His own disciples did. The night that he is arrested, he's in the garden of Gethsemane and what happens? All the disciples scatter. His most trusted friend, Peter, denies knowing him three times that night. And ultimately, everybody abandoned Jesus to the cross by himself. And then you think of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was one who understood what it was like for people to turn their back on him. I mean, when he became a, a, a Christian, nobody wanted to have anything to do with this spiritual terrorist, only Barnabas. And then he and Barnabas got into dispute and they split it ways. And then Mark leaves him. Demas turns his back for the things of the world. And even at the end of Paul's life, he is on trial and is alone. Everyone has left him. Everyone except for one man. And this one man came to his side. This one man was his greatest source of encouragement and blessing. As we continue in our series, Who's That? Today we want to look at a man who refused to leave the Apostle Paul by himself at his deepest, darkest crisis of his life. And this one man shows up. His name is mentioned twice in Paul's last letter that he would write, 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles, open to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 15. But the Apostle Paul mentions the name of three individuals, one of whom remained with him. His name is unknown to most of us. As a matter of fact, it's even difficult to pronounce. His name is Onisphorus. Onisphorus. Some people say Onisiphorus. That's from the south. But the Greek pronunciation of it is Onisphorus. And Onisphorus was a guy who refused to leave Paul. So let me give you the setup of what's happening. Paul is writing in 2 Timothy. This is his last letter. He's on death row. Paul had been arrested before, and he appealed to Caesar. And at the end of the book of, book of Acts, he finds his way in Rome. But he's under house arrest. He's free to come and go as he wants. He's free to have people come in to visit him. They can bring all kinds of supplies. They can encourage him. And then he's released. But then again, Paul is arrested later, again under Nero. And this time as he's arrested, he's not put in a home. He's put in a dungeon. 
And he's in a maximum security secret place where he is kept as a political prisoner. And in that situation, he is waiting for the trial for his execution. And Nero, who's a Caesar at that time, is wreaking havoc on the church and Christians all in the Roman Empire. So he is in prison and he is alone. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, Paul gives us what happens. He is writing to Timothy and saying, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, we don't know who Phygelus and Hermogenes are, but they are well known to Timothy and they're well known to the church in Ephesus. Most scholars believe that Phygelus and Hermogenes were false teachers, but they were also cowards. And these were people that were well-known, and yet they turned their back on the apostle Paul. Paul's on trial. Nobody there is with them except for Luke. We find that later in 2 Timothy. But these two great leaders run away. Now, why do they run away? Why are they hiding? Why do they not stand with the apostle Paul? Well, if they're false teachers, they're jealous of him. But if they're cowards, they're concerned about their own livelihood. You see, in Rome at that time, it was illegal to be a Christian. Nero had risen up to such a degree that he had the, the highest level of persecution on the church that was known. In fact, Nero had burned down some parts of the city and blamed it on believers. And as a result, believers were being rounded up. Many of them were being put to death, burned alive at the stake for Nero's garden parties at night. And Christianity was outlawed. And if you were a Christian, you were considered to be an atheist because you were not following the lordship of Caesar. And these two guys knew what it would cost to be a Christian. So they bailed on the Apostle Paul. You know what I love about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul is never afraid to identify false teachers or to identify flaws in people's lives. He isn't. And, and he just names them. These two guys you watch out for. Homogenes refused to stay with me. Phygelus ran away and hid. Mark, Demas... Alexander the coppersmith does me great harm, as he says at the end of this. The apostle Paul is not afraid of speaking truth. He's not afraid of being canceled out because people don't agree with him. The thing I love about Paul is he points out false teaching wherever it is. And here's what Paul knows. He knows that false teaching going undetected or unconfronted becomes more deadly. Well, we're living in a culture today where we're constantly bombarded with false doctrine, aren't we? And too many of us are afraid to say anything because we think we might be seen as mean. We might be seen as bigots. We might even be seen as racist because we don't speak truth. And we need to speak truth, especially when there's error. And we need to be bold about that. We don't need to be ashamed about that, as the Apostle Paul did. You know, if I have in my medicine cabinet a bottle of pills that was poison. And this bottle of pills would kill you if you take one within minutes. And if I took on that bottle of pills and wrote the title, Essence of Peppermint, I've just made that bottle of poison more deadly. And when we as believers are not speaking truth and culture and pointing out false doctrines and false teaching, then what happened is those things can become more deadly and more poison to the generations to come. And the apostle Paul is straight on this. So he speaks about these two guys. And let me just say something. It's never a good thing for your name to be recorded in scripture as a coward or a false teacher. Because every Christian from that point on will see that and know who you are but here's what's happening in the midst of all of this. And Paul is by himself. There's one guy who is there, Onesiphorus. There's one guy that the Holy Spirit records his name for us 2,000 years later. Why? He does this so you and I can see the example of a man who can be an incredible blessing of a woman who can be an incredible blessing in the midst of difficult, dark times that other people are going through. And here 
is what Paul has to say about Onesiphorus. He says, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know well all the service he rendered in Ephesus. Three verses about Onesiphorus. He also appears later in chapter 4, verse 19. But only those times, that's all we know about Onesiphorus. So what do we do? We look at these passages and there's some things that we can glean from the life of Onesiphorus that I believe are a source of encouragement for you and me. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you four characteristics about his life that we glean from Scripture. And as we look through the historical documents, as we look at what, what is happening in this day of time, these four things that we can see that Onesiphorus was a blessing to Paul and to others. Here's the first thing. Onesiphorus was a source of refreshment to others. He was a source of refreshment. The apostle Paul says that straight up. He says, for he often refreshed me. Now scholars all agree that Onesiphorus must have been a man of great means. He must have been a man of some wealth because two times it mentions his household. And when the household is mentioned, it's not just family. It's more about his estate and the things that he had. So he was a very wealthy man. He was probably a very prominent man in the church because everyone in the church in Ephesus knew who Onesiphorus was, as did the apostle Paul. Paul spent three years in Ephesus in preaching the gospel, converting people, and discipling them. Onesiphorus must have been probably an early convert, maybe even led to faith by Paul himself. Maybe Paul discipled him. Some scholars believe he could have been a key leader in the church, a teacher, a deacon, not an elder, but in some high capacity, he was a well-known man. And the other thing that Paul says is that he refreshed me. The word refreshed, you'll love this. The word in the Greek means a breath of fresh air. He was a breath of fresh air. I mean, this guy refreshed me. He encouraged me. He blessed me. Now, we don't know exactly how he did it. Did he do it through generosity of his wealth and sharing it with others? Most likely. Did he do it by by encouraging Paul, praying with Paul, being a companion with Paul, supporting Paul, supporting his ministry? All kinds of thoughts can come into that. But whatever it is, he was a refreshment. He was a breath of fresh air to Paul. And not to Paul only, but to the whole church. And so what we see is this guy has this incredible um, appearance and attitude of blessing people. You know what his name means? It means bringer of profit. He was a bringer of profit to people. He's the kind of guy that when he walks into the room, there's like this breath of fresh air comes in. You know, it's been my history through the um, dealing with people in life that there are a number of kinds of people, but there are those kinds of people that you run into when you see them coming, you want to go the other way. You know what kind of people I'm talking about? Some of you, yeah, don't don't look at the person next to you. No, don't look. Uh, You see a person coming in, you want to go the other way. There's something about them. They drain you. They make you exhausted. You want to get away from them. And if they come to you and invite you to the most expensive restaurant in Wilmington, you will find a reason not to be able to go. I'm sorry, I just can't make it. You just don't want to be around those people. Then they're the kind of people who walk in and you can't wait to be with them. I mean, there's something about them. You're drawn to them. You want to spend time with them. You want to hear their heart. And they can invite you to go for a ride with them to the dump. And you could not think of anything better than you would like to do. Because you want to be with them. The Lord Jesus was like that. Do you know that the scripture says that when he entered into a village, people were waiting for him to come in? When you think about all the kinds of people that love to be with Jesus, the little children couldn't wait to see him. The sinners, those tax gatherers, the unrighteous of the culture knew that they were loved and his winsome kindness and his spirit drew people to him and they wanted to be with him. And Jesus even tells followers of his, if you want to be like me, 
then be like that. He even gives followers of Christ some commands. He says, you're the salt of the earth. In this world that is filled with no flavor, you be the flavor of the world. You are the light of the world. In this place where there's darkness and there's no illumination, you be a source of light and illumination to other people. He says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. For those who are followers of Christ, you are to be a freshness in the lives of other people. In this world that is stale and dead, and dry and thirsty. And my favorite, we are the aroma of of Christ, that we are to smell like Jesus in this world that's filled with stale air. What a wonderful opportunity we have to be a refreshment of other people. And the opposite of refreshment and, and a breath of fresh air is stale air, stagnant air, the kind of air nobody wants to be around. And the Lord Jesus is encouraging us to be like him, to be a source of refreshment to other people. Now, some people would say, you don't understand, Phil. My personality is not like that. Well, let me just remind you of this. Being a refreshment to others is not so much about my personality, but about the Spirit's power of producing spiritual fruit in me. That's what it's about. One of the things I love about pastoring Scott's Hill is so many people have demonstrated the example of being a refreshment to other people. Two weeks ago, a whole large group of folks from this church went to the Baptist Children's Home. And the reports that I've heard constantly have just been that of refreshment. They were able to minister to single moms with their small children. They were able to minister to kids who were displaced from their families, maybe because of difficulties or dysfunctions. They were able to minister to all those who were working at the children's home. So much so that last Sunday, one of the house parent couples came to Scott's Hill and they met with me afterwards, Andrew and uh, Pearl Ann. And when they met with me, they said, we had to come to this church this morning because of the difference that your people made last week and such a breath of fresh air, we needed to see the kind of church that these people are coming out of. That's what God wants us to be. I want to tell you, there are people all around you every single day who need somebody to be a refreshment to them. And let me just say this. Sometimes being a breath of fresh air doesn't just mean hugging him. It doesn't just mean saying niceties. It doesn't just mean patting them on the back. Sometimes people need the fresh of breath, a breath of fresh air and you telling them the truth. Because there's a breath of fresh air when people speak truth today, unashamedly. There's a breath of fresh air whenever people speak of righteousness and holiness. There's a breath of fresh air whenever people speak and stand on convictions that are unshakable. And this is what the world needs to see as we're modeling the the, the character of Christ flowing through us, we are called to be a refreshment to other people around you. Let me ask you this question. When people see you coming, do they run from you or run to you? Do they run from you or do they run to you because you exemplify the fruit of the Spirit, and the way you love them. That's what we're called to be, that people would run to us because of the character of Christ in us. Onesphorus was a refreshment to others. But here's the second thing he was. Onesphorus was relentless in his commitment to others. He was relentless in his commitment to others. Here's what Paul says about him in verse 17. He says, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. Now, here's what's interesting. Onesphorus is in Ephesus. Paul is in Rome. It's easy for Onesphorus to be committed to Paul in Ephesus, but Paul is in Rome. That's 1,500 miles by foot or 1,100 miles by foot and boat. That meant it would take Onesphorus several months to go and to come back. And he was so committed to Paul that he was willing to take this difficult journey. And and, and even though that journey of several months was difficult, it even goes further than that. Once he got to Rome, 
When he got there, he had to find Paul. Paul was a political prisoner put in a maximum security dungeon that was secret to most people. So what did he have to do? He had to find out where Paul was. The largest city in the Roman Empire, more prisons than any other city, he had to find the right contacts. He has to find the right um, um, direction. He probably had to pay people to be able to get into the prison and to find Paul. So he searched for him, as he said, earnestly, with great effort. And then he says, he found me which was a shock to Paul. And he found me. Can you believe it? This guy left Ephesus. He came to Rome. He searched diligently and he actually found where I was. Do you see the, 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 the depth of loyalty that he has for a brother in Christ? And not only that, Paul adds to it. He says, he was not ashamed of my chains. I'm a political prisoner. I'm on death row because of my faith in Christ. And this guy didn't run from me. He ran to me. In the midst of all of these trials and the circumstances of my life, he put his own life in jeopardy. And he wasn't embarrassed of who I am. I think what an incredible picture of loyalty, relentlessly committed to a brother in Christ. Now, when you go through the pages of Scripture, one of the things that you will find over and over again in the New Testament are what we call the one another passages. There are actually 63 or so one another passages. And these one another passages are commands of how we are to treat one another in Christ. Love one another. Serve one another. Forgive one another. Forbear with one another. Receive one another. Pray for one another. Stimulate one another to good deeds. I could go on and on and on. But every one of those is a commandment for us to do. And it's a commandment for us to pursue one another. In the life of the body of Christ, we, there is a call for us to be relentlessly committed in serving and taking care of one another. But here's the problem in the church. Too many times... We do not do that. Paul says these things, and, and all of these commandments are what we would say unqualified. That means this. There, there are no conditions to it. We're to love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, regardless of what we're going through. But here's the problem in a church too many times. Because somebody is going through a difficult time that we might not agree with, we too often write them off and abandon them. I don't know if I want to be around him anymore. You know, he's really questioning the goodness of God in his life, and, and, and I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with that. I, I don't want to be with them anymore. I've been watching how their kids have been acting and some of the things that their kids are going through. I, I just don't want to expose my kids to that. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. You know, that those individuals are struggling with some addictions, and, and I, I'm just, I, I don't really know how to, I'm just going to back off on that. And so you know what we do? We write each other off too often, too quickly. And the very people who need us to be relentlessly connected to them are the ones who are in the deepest, darkest places. The ones who have addictions need us to come along and love on them and support them and move forward with them. Those families who are struggling in crisis, they need us to embrace them and pray over them. The ones who have questions about God and the goodness or even questions about scripture need us to sit with them and walk through these difficult times so this can be a definitive moment in their life where they can walk away knowing the truth of God. Do you know that it has often been said and it is so true that the church of Jesus Christ is the only army in the world that shoots its wounded. Is it messy? Yes. Does it take a lot of resources and time? Yes. But if we're not going to be loyal to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and walking deeply with one another, we don't know the importance and the understanding of a brother or a person that sticks closer than a brother. You see, Onesiphorus teaches us this, 
that he was willing to go the distance for a fellow brother in the Lord. And you and I are called to stick together with one another and not write each other off so quickly because of the struggles that we all go through. Onisphorus, he was a refreshment to others. He was relentless in his commitment to others. But here's the third thing. He rendered great service to others. He rendered great service to others. Paul reminds Timothy of this. He says in the next verse, in verse 18, he says, and you, Timothy, you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Timothy, you of all people, if you put it in in the phrase, you of all people, Timothy, you know how wonderful Onesiphorus is in the lives of other people. It's just not what he did for me, Timothy. It's what he's doing for people all around him because Timothy would have known him well. Timothy's the pastor of that church. Paul has been there for three years. Timothy knows the work that he did. Now, we don't know. Maybe he was a deacon, as I said earlier. Maybe he taught classes. Whatever it was he did, it was an incredible service to the body of Christ. But not only to the body of Christ, he was an incredible service to Ephesus. He says that at Ephesus could mean at the church in Ephesus or at the community of Ephesus. He was a guy that constantly rendered incredible service everywhere he went. And apparently, it didn't matter whether they were in the church or outside of the church. He was that kind of guy. And we find that Peter tells us that we are to be that way as well. Why? Here's what Peter says. He says, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of the varied grace of God. Now, every person who's a child of God has received at least one spiritual gift. And all spiritual gifts are not for ourselves, they're for other people. And every spiritual gift that we have, we are to be good stewards because these are marks of the grace of God in people's lives. And so he was that kind of guy. We don't know what his giftedness was, but it clearly impacted the lives of so many people. If you're a child of God today, You're called to use your spiritual gift for others. And in using your spiritual gift in the lives of other people, you are demonstrating the very, the many-sided grace of God in the lives of people. And we're called to do that, whether it's inside of the church or outside of the church. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were walking at the beach one of those days where she's throwing sand all over me. And as we were walking at the beach, we were talking about all the people in our years of ministry here that have come and gone. And we were just talking about the number of people who have come and gone. We were talking about the people who were new coming into the church. And then I said, you know, isn't it interesting that we have a tendency to talk about the people who have come and gone, but what about the people who have come and stayed? And as we begin to roll in our minds, many of your names and faces just came because you were here before I got here. And you may be here after me. And the thing that we see is the faithfulness of so many and encourages my heart and the service. Some of you have been serving the Lord relentlessly since you've come to this church. Some of you have been in a student ministry, most of your ministry here. Some of you in a children's ministry. Some of you in a nursery. Some of you are working in college ministry. Some of you have been teaching. Some of you are with our strategic partners outside of this place, feeding the homeless regularly, driving meals on wheels and praying with people who are not connected to this body. Many of you are are involved in counseling, counseling single women who find themselves pregnant and need somebody to pray with them and walking them through the next steps. Some of you are involved in ministries in our community. I think of a group of men who go around and build wheelchair ramps for needy people. Do you realize that I went and walked through my neighborhood last week? I saw four wheelchair ramps built by men in this church in my neighborhood none of whom those people come to this church. And you are demonstrating and rendering an incredible service. And when we do that, here's what happens. People get a taste of the grace of God through you. And as we serve other people, then they begin to see the love of God coming through our lives. One of our core values here is to love others through service. 
And another core value is to live on mission. And if we're going to be the kind of onisphorous that God wants us to be, we're always serving others. Here's the last thing, and I have to close with this. Onisphorus risked his life for others. He risked his life for others. Now, there are two schools of thought about Onisphorus. Some scholars say what happened to him. Some say that he ministered in Rome, he went back to Ephesus, and he regained time with his family. And when Paul was speaking of him, he was speaking of him on his way back towards his family. In other words, he says this, in verse 16, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Why? Because Onesiphorus was not there. He's on his way back, protect his family as he's doing ministry. In chapter 4, verse 19, greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. People think he was on his journey. So there's a group of scholars that believe that he risked his life by going, but he made his way back to Ephesus. But there's a large group of scholars believe that Onesiphorus never made it home. He died. He was arrested because of his commitment to Christ. He too was thrown into a dungeon and most likely executed. And those two passages I just read, the reason he's speaking about the household is because Onesiphorus is no longer alive. Bless the household because Onesiphorus is dead. All of the language about Onesiphorus is past tense. It's in the aorist tense, which means maybe he was dead. And then in verse 18, Paul says this, may the Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. That's the judgment day. And you know well all the service he rendered at Ephesus. Many scholars believe that this points to the fact that Onesiphorus died. He paid the ultimate price for his ministry to other people for the sake of the gospel. Now, we can't know for sure. The scripture doesn't clearly define it, but we know this, he risked everything. He risked everything, and that was common in the church. Epaphroditus was also a partner of Paul. In Philippians chapter two, verse 30, he says, for he, Epaphroditus, nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. And so here's a guy serving almost to the point of death. Jesus speaks about this in John 15. He says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And then John picks this up in 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. He says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Here's the point. In the culture that you and I live in, not many of us are afraid that tomorrow we're going to die for the cause of Christ. You're probably not going to go to work tomorrow, and somebody's going to say, if you're a Christian, sign here. If you're not then um, you don't have to sign, you go to work. If you're a Christian, you're going to prison. If you're a Christian, we're gonna execute you today. We don't live in a culture like that, but many around the world do. And more today than ever are Christians being persecuted globally for their faith. But the question would be this, in our culture, how far would you willing to be able to go for the sake of the gospel? You might not lose your life, but are you willing to lose that promotion for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to lose that relationship for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to lose that popularity for the sake of the gospel? Are you willing to lose the freedoms that you have in this country to go serve in a third world country for the sake of the gospel? How much are you willing to risk for the cause of Christ and to minister to others? Onesiphorus, risk it all. He was a guy of great refreshment. He was a guy of relentless commitment. He was a guy who rendered service and risked his life. Now, as I think about the story of Onesiphorus, here's what I often come to. Left to our own selves, you and I are more like Phygelus and Hermogenes. Left to our own self, we will run away because of self-preservation. But in a relationship with Christ, we can learn and we can model these things. Why? Because Jesus himself is the greater Onesiphorus. He is the one who is a perfect friend that never abandons us. Consider what he did for us. Jesus is the only one who can refresh our empty souls. 
He's the only one can fill the void of emptiness inside of you. He's the only one who's the answer for all of life and the one that can satisfy every question and every desire of your soul. He is the only one who can refresh you. Jesus is the only one who relentlessly pursues us even in our failures. He never gives up on us. One old scholar says he's the hound of heaven nipping at our heels and he never lets us go. Jesus is the only one who rendered service that can reconcile us to God. On the cross, he's the only one who can redeem us. He's the only one who can forgive us. He's the only one who can put us in a right standing with a holy God because of our sin and our sinful nature. And Jesus is the only one who relinquished his life that you and I might live. There are two things in closing today. If you're a child of God, Jesus has done all of this for you, and now he calls you to be the refreshment in other people's lives. He calls us to be relentlessly committed to one another. He calls us to render service that blesses other people, and he's calling us to lay down our lives for the sake of the gospel. Through Onisphorus, we can see the kind of people who would be a blessing to others. If you're here today and you're not a believer, if you're here today, Jesus is the answer for you. He's the only one that can refresh your life. He's the only one who is actually pursuing you. He's the only one who rendered the service to reconcile you to God, and he's the only one who has given his life for you. And he is calling you today to surrender to him. And in this story of Onesiphorus, what we see is an incredible commitment and sacrifice. I read a story several months ago in a book about two little boys who were going fishing. And they were going in this wooded area that was kind of swampy, and they were going to this pond where it's kind of grown up. One of them was eight years old. One of them was five years old. The older brother was carrying the fishing rods, and as they were walking along the edge, both of them found themselves in quicksand, and they began to sink quickly. And they began to scream out for help, and they could not reach any way of getting out of the quicksand. And as they were screaming for help, this man who had happened to be walking the trails ran by, and he saw the five-year-old, and the, the sand was up to his neck, and he was screaming for help. He couldn't do a thing. Couldn't even put, pull his hands out of the sand. And the man grabbed some straw and stuff and got it around the little kid and somehow pulled him out. And he said, what are you doing in there? He said, my brother and I fell in. He says, where's your brother? He says, he's in there. He said, where is he? He said, I don't know, but I was standing on his shoulders. He gave his life for his little brother. And the Lord Jesus gave his life for us. And because he has done that, we are to be that kind of refreshment for others. The question is, what kind of person are you? When people see you coming, what do they do? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the life of Onisphorus. Thank you for the challenge that you've given to us today. Father, may we walk in a way that we can model the very fruit of the Spirit of God in each other's lives. May we be the people of God at this church that are a source of refreshment. May this church be such an impact in our community that if we shut the doors tomorrow, this community would miss us because of the way we love them and we serve them. And Father, would you raise up in this body so many Onisphoruses that we will be a breath of fresh air because of the Spirit of God who's working in us and because of the Lordship of Jesus, our King, whom we serve. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.